All right. Today we are going to talk about cascaded circuits. that orange. This is our last topic on op amps. So a cascaded uh, amplifier circuit is any circuit in which multiple amplifiers are chained together. So for example, let's say that I have the following circuit. All right, so this would be an example of a cascaded operational amplifier circuit. Um, it is two distinct op amps. Let's call this first one A1 and the second op amp A2. And the output of op amp A1 serves as one of the inputs to op amp A2. Um, and so there are a couple of different ways that we can analyze circuits. Uh, I think literally two different ways here. Uh, so the first one that we're going to utilize is the approach that we've been using, uh, that four-step approach, apply the ideal op-amp rules, determine the voltage V plus, and then do KCL uh, in order to determine our output. Uh, but we're going to have to do that to each of our op amp stages, okay? So,
the voltage present at the non-inverting terminal for op uh, operational amplifier one, I'm gonna call V1 plus, and then I can call this guy over here V2 plus, at my inverting terminals, I know then that V1 minus is equal to V1 plus. And over here, I know that V2 minus must be equal to V2 plus. If I apply ideal op amp rule number two, I know that this current is zero amps, this current is zero amps, this current is zero amps, and this current is zero amps. Um, I can then find the voltage V1 plus. What's that going to be? Zero volts. All right. So we're saying that uh, since no current can flow through that five kilo ohm resistor, uh, V1 plus is virtually affect, uh, virtually connected to ground. So we call this guy zero volts. V2 plus is going to be what? Three volts, nothing wild or crazy there. Then we're gonna apply Kirchhoff's current law at the inverting input terminal of both amplifiers. Um, so we're gonna add this current and this current and let's call this node right here for the sake of argument VA. And then we're also gonna have to apply Kirchhoff's current law at this node. So we're gonna add this guy and this guy, and that's gonna give us a relationship as well. So applying KCL at the inverting input terminal of amplifier one gives us zero minus five volts divided by eight kilo ohms plus zero minus VA divided by 12 kilo ohms is equal to zero. One equation, one unknown, we could solve that in a minute. We'll do just that. Well, then when we do KCL at the inverting input terminal of op amp two, we are going to have three volts minus VA divided by two kilo ohms plus three volts minus V out divided by nine kilo ohms is equal to zero. We have two equations, two unknowns, we can easily solve for the out. So let's do that. Uh, all right, so system solver two by two. Um, all right, so we have negative one over twelve thousand as our coefficient for VA. That's going to be equal, uh, zero is our coefficient for V out. In our first equation, our constant term is five volts over eight thousand. In our second equation, we have negative one over 2000 for V out. I'm about to sneeze, I think. I have negative one over 9000. And then for my constant term, I'm going to have minus three over 2000 minus three over 9,000 solve. 
And from this, I find VA is negative 7.5 volts and V out is 50.25 volts. It's really large. Let me make sure I put these numbers in real quick. All right, just just double click in here because that V out value four and a half seems really large. Mm. All right, negative one over twelve thousand. What stays the same? Five over eight thousand. Nope. Oh, All right. So that's one way. One thing that I want to point out here, you may be inclined to ask why we didn't do, say, Kirchhoff's current law, uh, why we didn't apply Kirchhoff's current law at node A or um, our output node, okay? Uh, and the reason that we absolutely cannot do that is because we don't have a relationship for the output current of the op amp itself. The input voltages and our feed resistive feedback network does not tell us anything whatsoever about the current that's leaving the output terminal of our op amp. So we can only ever apply KCL at the input terminals. Okay, so I just wanted to make that very, very clear. Um, we could have potentially developed another set of equations here and here um, where you would think I could take this guy and this guy and this guy, but that's assuming that that makes an undeserved assumption that there's no current leaving the output of operational amplifier one. Similarly, you could do KCL at the output of amplifier two. And it's, easily, it's easy to make that mistake. So just avoid ever doing KCL at the output of an op amp if you're using the ideal op amp model. So this is method one, and it is literally nothing more than everything we've done previously, or how we've been analyzing op amp circuits previously. Um, it's always applicable. We could modify this circuit, and I think I asked you to do it in a homework assignment by putting a feedback resistor between, say, the uh, inverting input terminal of op amp one and the output of op amp three and you would still just do the exact same methodology oops there would just be another current path around this loop that you would have to take care of it doesn't change anything you're still just applying kcl at the inverting inputs our second way of solving a circuit like this is to identify the circuit for its constituent parts and so what I mean by that is I'm going to draw a line here. Uh, let's do it in red. So everything to the left of this line, we would call stage one and everything to the right of this line is stage two. So if we ignored that stage two existed, what kind of operational amplifier do we see on the left hand side? What kind of uh, amplifier topology is that? Negative. So it's a negative feedback, obviously, uh, because there's a resistor placed between 
the inverting input terminal and the output terminal. It is an inverting amplifier, okay? So because we can identify that as an inverting amplifier, we know that whatever signal we have here, five volts, is going to be multiplied by a gain factor of negative 12 divided by eight. So, so this five volts gets scaled by a factor of negative 1.5, uh, so that means VA should be negative 7.5 volts, which is exactly what we got without doing any circuit analysis whatsoever. Our second stage is a modified um, differencing amplifier because the output of stage one, we could treat, now that we know what the output voltage of stage one is, we could treat everything to the left of this red line as a voltage source just giving us that output and then, uh, and then analyze the second stage. That's the beauty of cascaded op amp circuits, okay? So if you can identify the different gain stages as the common op amp topologies that we've discussed, you really don't have to do a whole heck of a lot of circuit analysis to figure out what's going on. In fact, you can break everything down into what you recognize and what you don't recognize and only have to use the circuit analysis method parts on what you're unsure if this is a particular op amp topology. That's really cascaded amplifier circuits in a nutshell. You can approach it the generic way that works for all op amp circuits or all negative feedback op amp circuits. Let me be explicit there. Or you can break things down into easily recognizable op amp topologies and then just use those building blocks to do what you want to do. Um, so, Let's talk about, because this is so wildly short, um, let's talk about a potential design type problem that we might try to tackle, okay? So let's say that I have an input signal, Vn is 2.5 cosine um, let me give it a specific frequency here 1000 pi t volts and I want to generate an output signal. Let me take that back. Let me let me make this five. An output signal that is 2.5 volts plus 2.5 sine 1000 pi t volts. So my input signal is a cosine function. My output signal is some DC portion plus some AC portion. And I have a phase shift here because I've switched from sine to co or from cosine to sine, okay? How do you think we might go about tackling this problem? Okay, this is, we want to design an op amp circuit that can do this. Okay, so, we know that our output signal is half as large, uh, the AC portion of our output signal is half as large, all right? So that means we, we need some gain that we're able to attenuate down. How are we gonna go about converting from cosine to sine? Uh, so cosine to sine, we could use a, a, an integrator though. So the, the, uh, the integral of cosine is positive sine or negative sine, I don't remember. Positive sine, okay. Now the problem with an integrator is that there is gonna be an initial condition that we have to take care of. I purposefully avoided that in the math by setting my integral from negative infinity and doing it out to T. 
Another thing that we could do is we could do a differentiator, which, so if we differentiated cosine, we have negative sine, right? And then we can convert that negative sign to positive sign by using an inverting amplifier, which could also be used to give us that scaling factor that we're looking for as well. So I would argue that let, let's look at our, our first stage, right? Simplish design problem. Okay. So negative, positive. Let's ground this guy. We're going to assume that VCC plus and VCC minus are whatever they need to be to make this guy work. Uh, I can never remember for the differentiator is the capacitor in the feedback or the resistor. I think it's the resistors in the feedback for the differentiator, I believe. So we're going to have some feedback resistor here, RF, that we would need to determine what it is. We're going to have some capacitor here. And then here is VN. And let's stop here. So this node, I'm going to call this guy A1. This node gives us negative RC times the derivative of Vn, right? Yeah, that's exactly what a differentiator does. So if we put in cosine, we're gonna get negative sign inside here. And then because this is a, uh, the input is applied to the crap, inverting input, we already take care of that negative sign there. So we should be able to, if we put five cosine a thousand pi T here, we should be able to choose a resistor and capacitor values that would give us exactly positive 2.5 sine 1000 pi t at the output. Yes, sir. I thought one over RC was for the integrate. I believe one over RC is for the integrator. RC in the numerator. Okay, so we figured out how to go from here to here. We'll worry about figuring out component values in a little bit, although it seems like we just need R times C to equal one half. So that's not gonna be wildly difficult. We just pick values that'll work. Yeah, oh, oh, so you're absolutely right. There's also going to be an omega that's going to get thrown out there too. So, um, so you're 100. You're 100. When we take the derivative, uh, because it's a sinusoidal function, when we take the derivative. There's going to be a frequency term that's going to go in front as well. So, so omega RC is going to need to equal one half. All right. That. How are we going to go about adding? Two and a half volts DC. All right, so we could use a summer. because we're scaling both of these guys by a factor of one. Um, the 
problem is, is that we've only talked about an inverting summer. So this is actually, we use this configuration where these resistors were equal to this resistor, whatever they all are, we would get negative 2.5 minus 2.5 sine 1000 by T. So what will we do to correct that? And then an inverter, another inverter with a gain of one. Okay. What if instead we didn't use a summing amplifier here, we used a differencing amplifier and we subtracted negative two and a half volts. That would get us there in two stages instead of three, right? So these are just the type of considerations that we can take into account or trying to figure out how to design a system for a given input to produce a given output, okay? Just a, a thought experiment of how we can cascade these things together. What are the different ways that we can take whatever our input signal is and process it in such a way to give us our desired outputs? Um, So, all right, so let's. Let me erase this guy right here. So if we feed this in to a differencing amplifier. So the question is, uh, was it the voltage present at the non-inverting input minus the voltage at the inverting input or was it the other way around? So I remember it being V1 minus V2. It's just the question is V1 the one connected? V2 was the one on the negative. All right. So so this is the one that should be on the positive input. So that means we need a resistor here. A resistor here. Because that's our voltage divider. Here's my negative feedback. And just for the sake of argument, here's B out. T. Um, let's make this guy, I'm just arbitrarily choosing 10 kilo ohms for all these resistors, just because I know, generally speaking, I want to choose something in the kilo ohm range. So this is my, the second stage here is my differencing amplifier where I'm taking this first signal, dividing it by two and then multiplying it by two by the gain factor of the... So this, uh, this voltage divider here, so whatever voltage I have here, I have exactly half that voltage here because of the voltage divider circuit. Then I'm scaling it by a factor of positive two based on the ratio of the feedback resistor of amplifier two to the resistor between that and the output, uh, the, the uh, yeah, that input signal. And then from that, I am subtracting one, negative one times negative 2.5 volts, which is the same as adding positive 2.5 volts. So let's circle back around here and then figure out what resistor and capacitor value you, we're going to need for the first stage. So to be explicit here, 
when I do my derivative of five cosine 1000 pi t, so this is gonna be negative RC, we're gonna have five volts, we're gonna have omega, which is a thousand, sorry, pi, not on a hundred pi. Not a T either. Times negative sine one thousand pi T. Trying to make sure that R times C. I'm just looking at this thing dimensionally to make to make sure what's going on. So I have a volt per ampere times farad is an amp second per volt times frequency, which is measured in per seconds. So that's giving me this is R volts that cancels that cancels amps amps seconds per seconds. Yeah, there we go. So all I'm left with is volts there. So I know that negative RC times 1000 pi needs to equal, uh, sorry, positive RC times 1000 pi needs to equal a factor of one half. So if we arbitrarily choose my feedback resistor is one kilo ohm, what value of capacitor am I going to need? C is going to be one over twice RF times 1000 pi looks like 159.155 nanofarads to me. We successfully completed a fairly straightforward design problem involving cascade op amps. Um, we went through this faster than I thought we would too. So this is the last op amp uh, lecture. We're on Friday, we're going to be moving on into, uh, I don't remember what the syllabus says, but it's, it's either parallel RLC circuits or series RLC circuits. So before we move on to an entirely different topic, is there any op amp related thing that seems sketchy and, and you would like to talk about before we move on? Yes, sir. So, um... I know last class uh, we talked about the different topologies of the different sound negative mm -hmm. circuits. Yes. Is there somewhere that we can like, do those more in depth and like, not written down? Is there, like, are there any um, textbooks or anything? Um, or is there any website where we can look up to find like a good layout of all that? Some of them are in the textbook for sure. Um, so I know it sh shouldn't be difficult to find effectively the inverting and non-inverting op amp in literally any, any circuits textbook, they'll show up. Uh, the integrators and differentiators may not be in a conventional circuits textbook. If they are, they're likely in the chapter on capacitors and inductors as opposed to the capacitor, or as opposed to the, the one on op amps. So this is a, a slight problem in as much as 
in most circuits textbooks, op amps are taught during the DC portion of the class. Um, so like in most textbooks, op amps are usually chapter three, four, or five. But in circuits one, for whatever reason, it's covered way, way later than that. Um, so op amps are, are typically covered before you would get into transient analysis and before you would introduce capacitors and inductors. So that's why you won't see the integrators and differentiators until significantly later in the textbook. Yeah. Um, so like for your, are you asking with regards to like an exam or yeah. something like that? Yeah. For the exam, I'm going to let you use an equation sheet. Okay. So, yeah. Um, for, so let's talk about that, I guess, for the next couple of minutes. So for your first exam, half of it is going to be on this op amp material. And then the second half of it is going to be on the RLC circuit analysis that we're going to kick off on uh, Friday. I will let you use an equation sheet for the exam. The only thing that you should put on your equation sheet should be the op amp stuff. And the reason why I say that is, let me figure out where Dropbox is. There we go. No. When did I make that stupid thing? Here we go. None of this should make any sense to you whatsoever yet. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, well before exam two is I'm going to print off copies of this. This is every possible equation that you would need to know to do any of the RLC circuit stuff. In fact, when you're doing your homework, you should have this next to you so that you don't have to derive a damn thing, okay? Um, so for your equation sheet for exam one, you would literally flip this guy over, write down all your op amp stuff and call it a day. So that, this is all the material that you'll need. Uh, well, technically this is all the material you'll need for parallel or series RLC circuits. So I do need to update it for generic RLC circuits. That, that's pretty trivial. Um, use the other side of this guy to put all of your op amp stuff on and then you're good to go. Um, I recognize that when you get out into the world and you're having to design things and stuff like that, you don't do it in a vacuum. You have the internet textbooks and all that kind of stuff available to you. So why should I test you on this when you don't have that same material of any time? Even when you go to take your FE, uh, if you choose to take it, most of this material is inside the FE study guide book. So I'm gonna at a minimum give you what you would get to take the qualifying exam for when you graduate from here on this material. <clears throat> so not to, in any way, shape or form to discourage you, most of the stuff I talked about with regards to the negative feedback circuits, those, those are in circuit textbook. They're just not necessarily going to be in the op amp chapter. Um, because the op amp chapter doesn't cover circuits with capacitors and inductors and stuff. So you might find it in some of the stuff would be in the, uh, the, the chapter on transient analysis. You may see also um, technically the differentiator and integrator are also filter circuits. One's a high pass filter and one's a low pass filter. I don't expect you to know what the hell that means yet. We're gonna talk about it in roughly four weeks, um, but for specific sinusoidal inputs, one cuts off signals of a specific frequency and the other, uh, or cuts off everything below a specific frequency and the other cuts off everything above a specific frequency. That, uh, so you might see those circuits there. Um, just depends on which textbook you're looking at. Uh, but the inverting and the non-inverting should be in the op amp chapter of every textbook. Very likely to see the differencing and the and the, uh, the weighted inverting summing there as well. Um, but the differentiator and integrator is probably gonna be significantly later on in, the text, in, in the most textbooks. Um, I don't know, let's, uh, hell, why not? Dropbox. The knowing one being that familiar with them is. Yeah, being able to identify it is not a bad, thing at all. Let's look. 
Here's a textbook. Op amps, page 183. I made my keyboard. So, so that was a pretty good guess. Big ugly circuit, kind of like the one I showed you guys, except this one is BJT specifically. I think the one I showed you guys was MOSFET. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah. Using an op amp as a switch. Practical op amp model. We talked about all that kind of groovy stuff. Let's see. Negative feedback circuits. They don't really talk about open loop and positive feedback in this textbook. Deriving why you can use the ideal op amp model. We did that. Inverting amplifier and a diagram for it. Inverting summing amplifier. All right, covered that guy. Another aside on something else the textbook writer thinks is important. Difference amplifier, unity gain buffer. And then here's a summary. So I guess I probably glossed over the uh, non-inverting one, but I'm willing to bet it's in this table. Yeah, so, so non-inverting, inverting, inverting summing, differencing, unity gain, non-inverting summing amplifier. And you'll see why I didn't bother to talk about it. This gets real wonky. And if you have more than two inputs, it just gets scary. So in my opinion, using a inverting summing amplifier cascaded into an inverting amplifier is way easier to figure out what's going to happen than actually just using a non-inverting sum. So all those are there in this particular free textbook. And then when you go into the uh, chapter on capacitors and inductors, it'll have you up. But all the relationships that we developed are all here too. So use the book, use my stuff. Don't, don't care which way you go. It's all the same to me. Any other op amp questions? All right, told you guys it's gonna be short, so uh, we're out half an hour early. Um, <clears throat> on Friday, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna talk about either series or parallel RLC circuits. So I'm not gonna give you any specific homework or anything, just be, try to refresh yourselves as much as you can on transient analysis, because that's exactly what we're doing. It's just gonna be with second order circuits. So having two energy storage elements and that wonkies up the math significantly. So just be in that mindset. Yes. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, I mean, you could look for a textbook and then look for, uh, you know, look for an online textbook, work the problems, and then look for the solutions manual online or something like that. Or you could do the textbook itself and then learn how to use LP Spice to verify all your answers that way. Um, yeah, uh, and that would be good practice for LP Spice. I, I don't know of a specific website or anything that's just going to have a wealth of problems, uh, but I do know that I have been able to find, I think, at least six different circuit analysis textbooks online. And that's what I use to refresh myself and make notes from and all that jazz. So yeah, and like I said, uh, this one right here that's pulled up is that Ulabi textbook. I think I talked about on literally the first day of class. This one you can actually download for free. Uh, and you're not stealing any money from the publisher or anything like that. He, he wants students to have it. All the others are probably pirated for better or worse. So, but uh, this one does a good job on some stuff and less so on others. But I think most of the material that we cover in this class, this is, this is a very good reference book. Uh, the Height, Kimberly, and Durbin book, which is the official textbook for this class, does, in my opinion, not as good of a job on uh, the transient analysis of RLC circuits in as much as it only focuses on series RLC 
<coughs> and parallel RLC, <coughs> which the overwhelming majority of two storage, uh, two energy storage element circuits that you're going to see aren't strictly series or aren't strictly parallel, and it does no introduction to how you would solve. <coughs> Goodness gracious. <coughs> Excuse me, a generic circuit. And then its section on three phase power analysis, in my opinion, is just the hottest of garbage. Um, this one does a reasonably good job of three phase power analysis explanation. Uh, the textbook uh, by Irwin and Nelms does the best out of all the ones that I've read. So I, I pull stuff from everywhere to try to give you guys the easiest path forward, at least what I think is the easiest path forward. So. Anyway, all right, anything else? See you guys on Friday where we're gonna do oh so much calculus. It's gonna be a blast. <laughs>